Well, let's open our Bibles to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians is also one of my favorite books of the Bible. I love the book of Philippians, and I love the book of Colossians. There's just so much good stuff there. So we've been in a series entitled Imagine, and the title of this message is Imagine Having an Ordered Life, an Ordered Life. Do you ever feel like your life is totally out of control? I mean, just flying off the handle, out of control, chaotic. Uh, probably all of us have been there one time or another. If you're not there, you will be one day. And uh, you feel like, what in the world is going on? But it, does God want us to have an out-of-control, chaotic life? And of course, we know the answer to that is what, church? No. He wants us to have a peaceful, happy, ordered life. But how can we have that? In Colossians chapter 3, verse 1, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Let's pray. Father, we are so easily distracted to the point that we often forget our calling and our purpose in life. When things are going awry, when things are chaotic, when things are confusing, we sometimes look at the things instead of to you. So God, I pray that you will teach us how to have an ordered life. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Through the years of ministry, I've known a lot of people that move from one crisis to another crisis to another crisis. You ever know anyone like that? You say, man, that's my life. Some of us, we can say, yeah, I've lived that way. It seems like one crisis follows another and then another. And it seems like I'm in a vicious cycle and I, I'm trying to figure out how to get out of it. But it's been very difficult and it's been a struggle for me. When I was pastoring at First Baptist Church in Bristow, there was a couple there that they fought with each other all the time. It was not uncommon for me to get a phone call at 10 p.m. or even 1 a.m. in the morning. And it would either be him calling me saying she's lost her mind or be her calling me saying he's gone crazy. And I would get up and I would go over to their house and try to break up a fight, try to talk some sense into them and try to pray with them and try to get them to see things uh, from a different perspective. But they were always at odds with one another, always fighting each other. And if I've ever known a chaotic couple in my life, it was that couple. I mean, living from one fight to another fight to another fight, from one disaster to another disaster, from one crisis to another crisis, and there was no peace in their home, no peace in their lives as individuals, even though they both claimed to be Christians, they didn't have any peace. And as I thought about their life and I thought about us, I, I thought, you know, God doesn't want us to have marriages like that. And God doesn't want us to have lives like that where we're at odds with one another and fighting with each other and constant unrest and, and constant disrespect in the home. God doesn't want us to live that way. He's got a better plan for us. So if I live my life the way God wants me to live my life, then there will be control and order in my life. And as a result of that, having control and order in my life, I will have a God-blessed life. Obversely, if I don't live by God's rules, and I live by my own rules, have you ever done that? You ever think that your rules are better than God's rules sometimes? And then on the other side, you think, man, I have messed up. I should have done it God's way, not my way. I shouldn't have pulled a Frank Sinatra. I did it my way. You know? We ought to be singing, I did it God's way. Amen? And so once we get on the other side, we think, what in the world was I thinking? And why did I do that? And why do I behave this way? Because all I've done is create confusion and chaos in my life, and that's not what I want. So the three things I want to share with you this morning, I think, will be helpful in, in understanding how God wants us to live our lives in order to happy, content life, peaceful life. The first thing is this. We've got to strive to have a healthy heart. Strive to have a healthy heart. Well, I want you to know from the 
outset here that God does what God does. Amen? But God says there are certain rules that you have to go by in order to receive the peace that you seek. There are certain things that you must do. The onus is on you to do what you know in your heart and what I've described to you in my word to do. That's what God would say to us. So it's our job to do certain things. What are those things? I want you to see again in verse 1. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of what, church? Heaven. Not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. So put to death sinful, earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world because of these sins the anger of God is coming now I want to pause there for a moment he tells us that if these sins are in your life you can chalk it down the anger of God will come against you now did I make that up or is that what it says if I allow those things to consume my heart and mind the anger of God will come against me verse 7 you used to do these things when your life was still a part of this world. So he's saying these are things that you did before you met Jesus as your Savior. And these things that you did before you met Jesus as your Savior should not be included in your life now that you know Jesus as your Savior. You used to do these things when your life was still a part of this world, but now is the time to get rid of what? Anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature. So we're going to get rid of some things, and we're going to put on some new things. What are those things? And be renewed as you learn to know your Creator and become like Him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters and he lives in all of us I'm thankful for that so what does it mean if I'm gonna have a peaceful life an ordered life that means there's got to be certain disciplines that I abide by certain disciplines we don't like that word discipline do we I mean it stirs up negative connotations and memories I don't like discipline yet you look at every great person for God in this world that have lived a disciplined life you study their lives and you see that they were not afraid to do those things that God told them to do and they left out some things put in other things and God says these are the people I approve of let me ask you a question church do you want to be a person that God approves of three of you do do you want to be a person that God approves of yes we all do we all have that desire but if we're not fully committed to walking with the Lord will be easily compromised did you know that I read a story about a, a, a Haitian pastor he told this story to his congregation he said there was a man who wanted to sell his hut his little house for two thousand dollars a buyer came along and said I would like to buy your house but all I have is one thousand dollars would you receive or accept a thousand dollars instead of two thousand and the seller said, let me think about it. He thought about it. And then finally he said, yes, I will sell you my house for $1,000. However, you have to leave a nail on the front door that will belong to me. You have to promise me that you will never touch that nail. You'll never remove that nail. The nail belongs to me. If you'll do that and agree to that, I'll sell you my house for $1,000. The man agreed. About a year went by. And the original owner of the home came back. He said, I want to buy my house back. And the new owner said, no, I like the house. It's exactly where I want to live. It's suiting all of my needs. It's not for sale. I won't sell it back to you. And so the original owner went out and found the carcass of a dead dog. And he hung that dog on that nail on the front door. 
Have you ever smelled anything dead? It's a certain kind of smell, isn't it? And it permeates everything. Well, that new owner, he would go home, and there's that dead dog. He promised that he would not remove that nail, and there's that dog hanging on. He couldn't stand the stench, and he'd go inside his house, and the stench had even crept into his house, and after a while, it became unlivable, so he agreed to sell his house back to the original owner. You say, now, preacher, why are you telling us that gross story? Well, it is a little bit gross, but here's the point I want you to understand. If you so much as leave even one nail, even one peg for Satan, he will hang his garbage on it. Are you with me? You say, well, I've gotten rid of most of that stuff. There's just one or two things I've still got in my life. Let me tell you, if you've one or two things you are still capturing your heart, capturing your mind, those one of two things, or, or two things, Satan has hung his garbage on it, and it's rotting, and it's decaying, and it's spoiling all of the rest of your life. So what does Paul say? He's got a list right there of things that have to be taken out of our life. Look at this list again. Sexual immorality. Now, folks, I'll tell you, that's becoming more difficult all the time to get past because we are constantly tempted, whether you're looking at a magazine, driving down I-45, you see a giant billboard there. You know, I told you last week, it's got this woman scantily clad, and she's laying sprawled out across there, and she's got some Jack Daniels next to her. The message, of course, being, if you drink Jack Daniels, you get a woman like her. And I'm thinking, no, the message is, if you drink that, you won't care what the woman looks like. You ever heard that song, The Women All Get Prettier at Closing Time? How many of you ever heard that song? Raise your hand. Bunch of heathens. You say, well, you heard it, obviously. Well, you told me about it. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greediness, idolatry, anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, dirty language, and lying. That's quite a list, isn't it? God says you've got to get those things out of your life or you're not going to have an ordered life. You've got to get these things out of your life or you're not going to have a peaceful life. If you've got anger in your heart, anger in your life, you're not going to have a peaceful marriage. You're not going to have a peaceful home and family. There's going to be contentiousness there. There's going to be fighting there. And so the Bible says get rid of all of that. Have you ever noticed that sin has an insatiable appetite? You commit one sin, then you want to commit two. You commit two, you want to commit four. You commit four, you want to commit eight. And on and on and on it goes. It's, it's, it's insatiable. It just demands more and more of your life. Have you ever told a lie and almost get caught in that lie? And so in order to get out of that lie, you have to tell another lie to cover up for that one? Now, I know people in other churches do that. But we've never done that, right? I mean, one after the other, it, ha it takes on a life of its own. Am I right? That's the way sin works. And it begins to, co to consume our hearts and our lives. So that means that I've got to get to the point that I say, God, I need you to restore my heart. Because I've left some stuff in my heart that does not need to be there. I want you to see in verse 12. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy. So now he's given us a list of things we need to clothe ourselves with. Get rid of these things, but now put on these things. Tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. In other words, it's talking about a relationship to others he said you must love others and you must forgive others well they started it as a parent did you ever get on to your kids and you know walk in a room and they're fighting and you say what's going on here and what do they do they point to each other like they started it how much are we like children we're trying to tell God I, I shouldn't forgive them they started it they are the ones who offended me does it really matter to God who started it or does it matter to God who ends it see God wants you to forgive them Robin and I were at Walmart off, off 242 yesterday a young man that was uh, checking us out the groceries out I said you look like Josh Groban he had that dark curly hair he, had, he looked like Josh Groban he goes I get told that all the time he said, but really, you know, I like Jim Morrison. I like to be, and this guy's a young guy. I'm thinking, man, Jim Morrison's way before your time. 
you know. He said, you know, Jim Morrison was a poet, and I really like him. He's checking his groceries out. I really like Jim Morrison. He said, I'm a poet. I'm a songwriter. I'm a, I'm a musician. I play guitar. I play piano. And he started talking to us. And, and so I, you know, got a con conversation going with him. We found out he was, had moved back here recently from Jersey. And so I said, so do you have any family here? He said, yes, I do. He said, they live in Spring. And I said, well, I'm, I'm from Spring. He goes, yeah, they live, and he named the community. I won't name it, but it's a, a very nice, expensive homes, gated community. And as I talked to this young man, he said to us, I'm trying to figure out a way to run my keyboard in my car because I can't play it, you know, I, I'm, I'm living in my car. And I thought somewhere there's a lack of forgiveness going on. When you got a kid who's homeless, living in his car, and his parents live not very far from him, in a gated community, in a nice big home, and their son's living in their car. I don't know the whole story. I don't know what's going on. He seemed to be an intelligent, articulate young man. But somewhere along the line, someone's not willing to forgive. Maybe there's a hurt on his side that he created or their side that they created, or maybe both. I don't know. But do you see this morning how much a lack of forgiveness destroys us? It doesn't matter who started it. God is more interested in who is going to end it. And the Bible says right there, love to be like Jesus, forgive to be like Jesus. That's what we've got to do. I, I came across a, a story about um, farmers in Alabama. And you say, preacher, you must have been really bored reading about farmers in Alabama. Well, I was just really, really looking for an illustration. And I didn't know this. I really didn't. Maybe some of you know it. But these farmers in Alabama years ago planted, year after year, they planted cotton. And one year, guess what got in their cotton? Boll weevils. I didn't even know boll weevils was really a thing. I thought it was a made-up critter. And boll weevils got in their cotton and destroyed their crop. And the next year, the boll weevils came back again and destroyed their crop again. Uh, their crop again. The farmers got together. What are we going to do? And one of them said, why don't we try growing peanuts? And so they grew peanuts that third year, and they made so much money, they were able to pay off all their debt from the previous two years and still make a profit. And if you go today to Enterprise, Alabama, and go down to the town square, you will see a gigantic statue that's been erected to the boll weevil. There it is. They said, we want to thank the boll weevil. If it had not been for the boll weevil, we would have never discovered peanuts. Pretty interesting story, right? Here's the thing. That the thing that hurt them really served them. The thing that hurt them a couple of years really gave them much more wealth from then on. And here's what we do. We let something hurt us, and we hang on to it. A lack of forgiveness you know or we we have something that happens in our life and we just say woe is me I shouldn't have done that and we just beat ourselves up for the rest of our life but you know I've known a lot of people through the years that used to be alcoholics they used to be drug addicts or they used to have done this or done that bad things and it was a horrible thing that they did but God said if you'll give that to me I'll use it for my glory and so I've seen these same people give whatever it was that used to occupy their hearts to God and were bad things, and God says, all right, now I'm going to get some good out of it. They say, well, what kind of good? I've seen those same people reach back and help another drug addict get out of drug abuse, help an alcoholic get out of alcohol abuse, help someone get out of whatever they used to do. See, God used it for his glory. So whatever hurts you, turn it over to God and let it help you. Amen? There's another thing I see here, share a happy heart. Share a happy heart. How many of you believe that you ought to have a happy heart? You know, I told you about a guy before that uh, we had as a member of our church when I was a youth minister. His name was Tom. And Tom, we started getting phone calls on Mondays, and they were chewing us out. Said, we don't appreciate you sending your people over here waking us up on Sunday morning and chewing us out for not going to church. And that's what Tom was doing. During the Sunday school hour, he felt led of the Lord. 
to go knock on the doors. My name is Tom so-and-so, and I want to know, why aren't you in church this morning? You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Do you think that's ever going to motivate anybody to go to church? I think what motivates people to go to church and be interested in what we claim as, uh, you know, as our, our birthright, and, uh, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ, our new birthright, uh, the only thing that's going to make them want that is if they see joy and happiness in our life. That's what's going to make the difference. Do you agree with that? They're not going to want, if all we do is walk around sour all the time, angry all the time. So that means that we've got some more work to do. Verse 15, concerning this happy heart. And let the peace, and underline or highlight on your devices that word let, L-E-T. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. Now notice that phrase there, let the peace. Look at that word let. That word let implies a choice. So God's Word is saying you can choose peace or you can not choose peace. You can choose an ordered life or you can choose a life of disarray. But the onus is upon you. What does that mean? Well, sometimes at funerals I, I tell this story, some of you have heard it, about a little boy that moved to a, a canyon area with his mom, dad. One day he got mad at his mother and he ran out in the backyard, and he was so angry at her, about five years old, he looked back at the house and said, I hate you! And an echo came back, and the echo said, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. And the little boy began to cry, ran back in the house, he said, Mama, somebody out there hates me. <laughs> the mother knew what had happened, she took him back outside, she said, now cup your hands over your mouth as loud as you can, yell the words, I love you, and he yelled the words, I love you! And the echo came back, I love you, I love you. And the moral of the story is we reap what we sow. If you're always in a bad mood and that's what you come home and you, you just, you're going to make everybody else in a bad mood because you're in a bad mood and then you wonder why they're treating you like they treat you is because you treated them like dirt. If you sow anger, you're going to get anger back. If you sow bitterness, that's what you're going to get back. Obviously, if you sow joy, that's what you're going to get back. If you sow happiness, that's what you're going to get back. Because the Bible is true, and we do, in fact, reap what we sow. Amen? That's the truth of the Word of God. So sow whatever it is that you need. My brother-in-law, he doesn't do it now, but back when he was younger, he was really skinny, about as big around as my little finger, and he wanted to get stronger and get bigger, and so he started lifting weights. And after a few years of lifting weights, he just made me sick because he was built like this. I am too, it's just upside down. You know. He wanted more strength, so to get more strength, he gave away strength and he got more in return. That's God's law, right? You reap what you sow. Now, that means that we gotta, if we're going to have a happy heart, we've got to learn to respect others. Respect is foreign to today's culture. Do you agree with me that we, are, we have become more and more disrespectful as a country? We have. Verse 15, for as members of one body, you are called to live in peace. We're called to live in what church? And always be thankful. So here's what the Bible says. When you learn to respect others, you will have joy in your heart and your life. But today, we live in a culture that no one wants to give respect until they get it. We got kids in school, and we got a lot of educators in our church. And they will tell you, that kids today are more disrespectful than they've ever been. And, and then when you meet their parents, you know why. You know, how many of you were like me? If I got in trouble at school, I got in trouble at home. You know, anybody grow up that way? Today, if you get in trouble at school, you got a lawsuit on your hands. Because my baby never does anything wrong. Right? we got to learn to respect each other. And this is my two cents worth, okay? This isn't the Bible. It is in the book of Mark. <laughs> Parents, even grandparents, teach your kids and your grandkids to say yes, sir, and no, sir, and yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. <laughs> Some of you say, well, that's old-fashioned and that's old-timey. Let me tell you something. Being respectful is never out of style. Never. And if you teach your kids that, they will rise like cream to the top. 
because it's so rare these days. You want to give your kid a leg up in this world, teach them to be respectful because it's so rare these days that they become noticed. This person respects authority. And you know what we have now? we got teenagers. They don't respect their teachers. They don't respect, it starts with their parents. They don't respect their parents because their parents don't respect each other. Then their kids don't respect each other. They go to school. They don't respect the teachers. And then guess what? They don't respect the law. And then the parents say, well, how did my kid wind up in, in, in jail or in prison or doing this or do that? Because you never taught them to respect. You know where respect begins? It begins in the home. Are you hearing me? It begins in the home. And daddies need to stay home with their kids, not running off. And I thank God for single mothers who had to raise their kids on their own. You know, my dad died when I was six years old. So my mother spent a lot of years raising us on her own. She worked in a hamburger joint trying to, to provide for her family. So I, I know that side of watching my mother who was single for a lot of years trying to provide for her family and it's not an easy thing to do but my question is where are the dads dads need to stay home quit running around to their wives and cheating on their wives and doing those things you got children you've got a responsibility you say well okay i'm home then you need to be there too not just be there physically you need to be there you know what i'm talking about emotionally you need to be at home when you are at home you say, preacher, you sound like you're mad. Well, I am a little bit. Employees don't want to give respect to their bosses anymore. I'm not going to respect my boss. I'll just join the bandwagon. Nobody else respects him. I don't respect him either. Let me tell you something. If you learn to respect your boss, again, you'll rise like cream to the top. He'll take note of that because anybody can disrespect somebody else. But it takes a believer with a good heart that says, I'm going to respect my boss because he's my boss. Amen? He has authority. So church members sometimes don't respect each other. They don't respect their pastor. They don't respect the deacons. And sometimes it goes on and on like that. You know, here's, here's the whole thing. If you want respect, show respect, and you'll get it back. Are you with me, church? You know what happy hearts bring? They bring peace to a home. They bring peace to work. They bring peace to church. That's what happy hearts do. When I was serving in my first church, there was a man there. I, I won't tell you his name. I'll give you his initial. It was Virgil. He was angry all the time. You ever met somebody? I mean, if he couldn't find something to be angry about, he got angry about that. I mean, he used to just stomp through the halls like this, bam, bam, bam. He had a big, bulbous, bald head. And his face was always red because he was always mad about something. Even his, his kids who were grown, they would just shake their heads and say, you know, they, their daddy embarrassed them. Because he was always so angry. That not, ought not be the testimony. He's dead and gone on to be with Jesus, I hope. But you know something? That ought, I don't want that to be the testimony of, of my life. When I'm, I'm dead and gone, I don't want somebody to say, you know, he was always mad. He was always upset, always angry about something. I, I want them to say, that man loved Jesus. What do you want said about you? Because whatever you're doing right now is what's going to be said about you. You hear me, church? That means I've got to become a positive influence in verse 16. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill our lives. Teach and counsel each other with all wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative, or the word might be ambassador, the representative or ambassador of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to him or through him to God the Father. We've got a lot of good things to share, don't we? We do. Man, we've got the gospel, the fact that Jesus Christ loved you, died on the cross for you, wants to save you. The bad news is we're all sinners. The good news is we can be born again and forgiven of our sins. Amen. And that's what we ought to show this world, the gospel of Jesus, the word of God. Be an encourager. Those are rare these days. Just go to work and say, I'm going to encourage. God, help me to be an encouragement to three people today. Do you think that might, over a period of time, change your office environment? If you would just be the catalyst that God could use, an ambassador and a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm going to speak positive things to at least three people today, three neighbors today, three strangers today. Do you think that might 
just change our community and make us a little bit more positive as a community if we would just start sharing what God wants us to share. It's our responsibility to influence others. It's our responsibility to be a lighthouse in this world of darkness. It's not going to happen by accident. It happens by design and determination. Will you do that? Here's the last thing. Let's talk about where we live. Imagine Adam and Eve, God creating that very first home, very first couple, living in an absolutely perfect environment. 72 degrees year-round. Like San Diego without the nutcases. I mean a beautiful place. Amen. I mean it's a wonderful place. And what happened? They let sin creep in and it destroyed their home. Who established the home? It was God. And God says, I want to use the home to establish generations of Christ followers. God wants to use your home so you can raise up kids, or as a grandparent, raise up grandkids, be a good witness and testimony to them, so that God can have more and more Christ followers. That's what He wants. But most of our homes today are filled with anger and a lack of peace. There was a woman who wanted to divorce her husband. She was so mad at him. She went and found a divorce attorney, and she said, I want to get my husband. I want to take him for every last dime he's got. I want to, how can I hurt him the most? And the attorney said, I'll tell you what we can do. You go home, and for three months, treat him like a king. Treat him like royalty. And then three months later, bam, we'll hit him with those divorce papers, and that will really hurt him to the core of his being. She agreed. She went home, and for three months, she treated her husband like a king. And three months later, she came back to the divorce attorney and called it off. She, she was reaping a lot of what she was sowing in her husband. And a lot of us, the reason we don't get back what we need is because we're not sowing into our spouses what they need. You say, well, I'm waiting for them to start it. No, it doesn't work that way. Whatever you need, you give away and you get it back. You see, every one of us, every one of us have a role to fill in life. This is in verse 18. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting for those who belong to the Lord. I love that verse. It's not even in Robin's Bible. She tore it clean out. <laughs> and husbands, love your wives and never treat them harshly. Hmm. Children, always obey your parents, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not aggravate your children, or they will become discouraged. Look at that right there. Look at the order. Wives, submit to your husbands. And husbands, that doesn't mean you can trample on your wife. That's not what that means. It doesn't mean she's got to do whatever I say. That's not, she's not your slave. She's your wife. But there's a spirit of submission. You know what that is? When women show men respect, that's what we need. Did you know that men need respect more than love? Are you hearing me? That's what we need. And then it says, husbands, love your wives. Never treat her harshly. <laughs> Do you know what women need? Love. Men need respect, first and foremost. Women need love, first and foremost. And then it says, children, obey your parents. Huh. That's God's order. That's how it works. Why are we trying to mess it up in our world? Because we think we're smarter than God. There's a new word that's come out called complementarianism. Complementarianism. And here's what it's saying. In light of all this transgender stuff that's come out, where people are now saying it doesn't matter if it's two men or two women together it doesn't matter if it's one man and three women or one man and four men and this and that I watched a video yesterday this woman thinks she's a cat I kid you not she's got a boyfriend who believes she's a cat she was being interviewed 
and the interviewer asked her a question. You know what she did? She said, meow, 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 meow. And he interpreted for her. Well, we've lost our minds. Am I right? What's the lady's name? Rachel, what's her name? That was the head of the NAACP chapter in her area. It turned out she was white, been pretending to be black. You know what I'm talking about? You could pretend to be black, but that didn't make you black. A man could pretend to be a woman, that didn't make you a woman. Every cell in your body as a man has a Y chromosome. You're a man. And we're living in a world where it just, you know, anything goes. It just, why, why, why is it coming? Let me tell you why it's coming. Satan is trying to disrupt God's order. Are you hearing me? And it doesn't work that way. Amen. If I've got to choose between Satan's order and God's order, I'm going to choose God's every time. Because his order works. Nothing else does. So I would say to you, Let's do things God's way. Let's quit trying to do things our way. If you want a peaceful life, an ordered life, change some things. Get rid of some things and add some things. And you'll have the kind of life that you seek and that you really want.